We have a next uh, very special guest, um, Alex from Scale.ai. Let's give it up for Alex. How are you, buddy? Great. Good Good to see you. Here. A lot of people here. A lot of people here. That's only a tenth of the audience. <laughs> Most of them are online. So, um, before we get started, uh, can you tell everyone about what Scale is? And uh, it's one of the most amazing companies. You and I met in Davos um, last January, and um, it took about 60 seconds for me to say, we got a partner with these folks, and we are actually uh, the largest uh, strategic investor in, um, in Scale. We've act we, we created a billion dollar fund, and Scale is one of the first investments, of, one, one of the first few investments we made there. But tell the audience about why, what the consequence of Scale.ai. Is. Yeah, so um, Scale, we're the data foundry that powers all of the uh, incredibly advanced data that goes into the largest AI projects today, including all of the major large language models. If you kind of take a step back, AI is made up of three major components. Uh, you have compute, uh, which folks like uh, NVIDIA work on. You have algorithms, which folks like OpenAI or Google or Anthropic build. Uh, and then you have data. And our role in the ecosystem is to produce all of the frontier data, all the very advanced data that goes into the training of these algorithms, and then partner closely with enterprises and governments to enable them to utilize their own proprietary data to build customized AI systems. And Alex, actually, the way you had talked about this at the recent event that you had um, you know, last week, and we think there's probably two more dimensions uh, around AI, which is one of them is low latency, high performance networking is going to be a fourth dimension, I think, which is going to be uh, really important for back-end intra-GPU communication at low latency. And then the fifth dimension is security, where AI safety is going to be a pretty big deal. So, um, so tell us about... You know, you've been um, with, um, with in this industry for a long time, all the way back from an autonomous, autonomous driving was the primary use case for AI. So give a little bit of history. Your background is really interesting. So talk a little bit about how did you decide to found Scale AI? Yeah, so I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, uh, the, the birthplace of the atomic bomb. I mention that because, um, uh, you know, I was sort of, in, in context, it is like the, the most recent technology to uh, artificial intelligence that I think has as deep security uh, and frankly geopolitical implications as, as artificial intelligence. I mean, um, uh, what you mentioned about AI safety is definitely very, uh, very prescient and something that, you know, at our event, we had the folks from the White House who are actively thinking about the technology and, and put out the executive order, for example, um, talk about the risks that they see with the technology. Yep. Um, but yeah, I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and then I went to MIT and I studied uh, artificial intelligence, you know, neural networks at the time. Um, and I quickly realized that data was uh, the, the very clear bottleneck towards building powerful AI systems. Um, and, you know, there were plenty Which of. Which today it seems obvious, but back then it was a pretty insightful, you know, kind of counterintuitive yeah. thought. I mean, back then the, the sort of cutting edge technology was, um, you know, uh, Google had just released algorithms that could recognize cats in YouTube videos. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so it was, it's been, it is staggering. I mean, that was, it was, I started the company in 2016. It's been staggering to see from that moment till now, um, you know, the power of the technology. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think we, we recognized early on that, that data was going to be a limiter um, and there was nobody really working on it. Um, and fast forward today, I think it like, to your point, everybody I talk to, whether it's, you know, our customers, the major labs, like, you know, the open AIs or the metas of the world or, uh, or large enterprises like Morgan Stanley or MasterCard or even, or our, our partnership between Cisco and scale, you know, I think everybody recognizes that data is gold and data is going to be what will differentiate and power the next generation of, of powerful AI capabilities. And so, as we think about the evolution of AI, um, you know, we are clearly going towards a path of super intelligence. And you talked about this as well. You've talked about it quite a bit. Walk us through this notion of artificial general intelligence, super intelligence. First, define it for people. And then what do you think the impediments are going to be for us to get there? Well, what's the, what are the hurdles that we have to overcome? 
Yeah, so um, first, artificial general intelligence or super intelligence are AI systems that are, you know, for all intents and purposes, um, as smart or smarter than, than most humans. Um, so one way to think about this is, you know, if you think about what are all the tasks that humans can do, like all of the various intelligence tasks um, that, that humans are capable of, if you can build an automated system that can do, let's say, 90% of those tasks, that's probably, you know, artificial general intelligence. Um, the, uh, you know, we already have AI systems that are better than humans at some things. You know, we have, uh, you know, AI beats humans at chess and Go and most most games. Um, AI uh, with recent models like O1 from OpenAI and others, you know, they beat uh, most humans at math capabilities and computer science capabilities and, and whatnot. Um, but the question is, how general can we make that? How can we make these systems very smart? And and to answer this question, you know, I usually like to break down. Um, the history of AI into, into kind of three phases. And we've sort of lived the first two phases and we're about to sort of embark on this third phase. Mm. Um, you know, the first two phases uh, are, the first phase was really 2012 to 2018. And this was kind of the, the early R&D cycle. This was, you know, this was the era when, you know, kind of as I mentioned, like, you know, detecting cats in YouTube videos was, was staggering and spectacular. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of tinkering and nobody really, you know, people I think dreamed of AGI, but it was, it was clearly extremely far. And then in 2018, um, OpenAI trained the very first GPT model. And there were sort of like these two innovations back to back, the transformer model from Google and then GPT uh, from OpenAI. And that began uh, from 2018 to 2024, uh, what I call the scaling phase. And this was a period where we scaled the, the size and, and sort of magnitude and resources of the models roughly a million times. Um, we went from GPT to GPT-4, now, uh, now much further than that. You know, Anthropic just released a new model yesterday. Um, and the amount of computational power that's gone in has grown. Uh, staggering amounts, the amount of uh, data that's gone in has grown, staggering amounts, the requirements on infrastructure, uh, as you mentioned, are like are incredibly high. The requirements of networking and interconnect and all that are very high. Um, the requirements on um, the, and then the algorithms themselves actually mostly stayed the same. And so we've gone, we've mostly just grown the investment level to, from, you know. Uh, the algorithms have mostly stayed the same as, um, as the advancements have happened. Yeah, for, for this past era of this past six years, roughly. And so the, you know, from 20, um, uh, from 2018, maybe the models cost like, you know, a million or $2 million to train. And now they cost, you know, the investment, the total dollars in by the, by the AI companies and the hyperscalers this year into building the next generation of AI models is north of 200 billion. 200 billion. Yeah. So just process that for a moment. There's $200 billion being spent on training these models. How much is coming out on the other end on inferencing um, and um, you know, making sure that you're actually getting the return from the models that have been trained so far? Yeah, yeah, well, so by the way, it's important to know, I mean, like the, these numbers are just really big. I, the US uh, defense budget is roughly like 800, 900 billion dollars. So 200 billion into training um, uh, AGI. I mean, this is one of the, the biggest, you know, human projects um, of, of our time. You know, the monetization on the other end is interesting. I think that the, um, you know, ChatGPT is a breakaway uh, successful product, um, you know, in the, you know, let's call it like roughly $5 billion a year of, of annual revenue. That's definitely the most successful product. Um, and I think we, uh, you know, what we're seeing is kind of this mismatch where like the, um, you have to invest so far ahead of the future model. So if you look at the, the amount of investment that went into the models that power ChatGPT today, you know, is in the hundreds of millions. And then the product is generating billions of dollars. Um, what all of the, the mega tech companies are seeing is, hey, if, if that relationship holds, then like I have to invest ahead. You know, obviously there's a competitive dynamic sure. too. I gotta invest ahead and then you know see what comes out the other side the other side. But there's some there's some level of speculation there, right? Like investing two hundred million dollars, obviously it's a lot of money. It's hard to get a return on two hundred billion dollars, but um, the belief is that you know we're we're in this path to super intelligence. That's exactly my point, is there's most of the use cases haven't fully been realized based on the power of what we're doing with the training of the models. Um, and so you had talked about five very interesting things, which were 
going to be impediments to, you know, uh, the path to superintelligence. I'm just going to kind of lay them out, and then you can talk a little bit about each about a few of them. One of them was we're we're hitting a data wall, which is we're running out of publicly available data to train the models, um, and so we need much more what you call frontier data, um, and so, um, so 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 that was one. The second one was. The evals, the benchmarks are simply saturated. It's not that there's not that much of a differential between the models. It's that the benchmarks aren't sophisticated enough to be able to tell the difference between the models. Uh, number three was the future is agentic, which you saw a little bit of an illustration of in a, uh, what we announced. Four is uh, chips and energy are gonna become a big bottleneck. And five is uh, we have to be aware because China is catching up. So uh, t talk for a couple sentences in each one of these. How about the data wall? Yeah, so, so going through them, the data wall is clear. I mean, we've basically exhausted the entire internet, um, and so we need new sources of data. There's basically two sources of data that are, gonna, that are gonna play a role. One is new data that we generate, and this will be very advanced data form. This will be like reasoning data, or agentic data, or multimodal data, or you know, embodied AI, like robotics data. Like it's gonna be the kinds of stuff that you, like, you cannot find on the internet, and is very, very sophisticated. And then there's private proprietary data. You know, um, GPT-4 was trained on about one petabyte of data, and JP Morgan Chase, just as like one example, has 150 petabytes of data. Um, so, so the amount of enterprise data that's out there is just enormous. Orders of magnitude higher. Um, evals. Talk about evals. Yeah, this is this I think is like where a lot of risk comes in, which is we are just launching more and more powerful AI systems without any ability to measure how powerful they are. Um, and that, uh, you know, any sci-fi movie will tell you that that ends poorly. So uh, uh, so I think this, this was a huge push, for example, from the White House, um, huge push from the Department of Defense and other areas, which is we need much more sophisticated ability to measure how powerful the AI systems are. We talked about agents. Um, anything, any insights on the agent side on making sure that you can automate workflows? Yeah, I think the exciting thing about agents is that we're going to walk up a, you know, kind of like how there was uh, level one through level five of, of autonomous vehicles, mm -hmm. which was really, you know, Tesla autopilot for a long time is sort of like level two, you know, you still have to pay attention, you still have to like really monitor the situation. Um, but now you have Waymo's in San Francisco where you just get in the car, you don't have to do anything, the car drives itself. And I think that's what we're gonna see out of agents, um, which is very exciting, which is, you know, going from something that you like, you, know, you really have to pay a lot of attention to towards something that, you know, really just starts, you trust and takes care of the job. Chips and energy. I mean, this is this one is this one is crazy. I think that the um, so the conservative estimates are that we need 20, um, uh, uh, 20 gigawatts of power servicing data centers, which I think is about like five Chicago's worth of energy um, in the next call it two or three years. So um, that's why you're seeing all this news about nuclear, um, a lot of nuclear production, uh, nuclear fission production um, being, being built up. I mean, the, the energy and chip uh, uh, your requirements are massive. And it relates to the last point, which is, um, which is the chips. So right now, 100% of the high-end chips that power AI systems are uh, manufactured and fabricated in Taiwan. Um, and uh, there's a lot of geopolitical risk in that overall situation. And so to talk a little bit, little bit about, you know, on the three things that you talked about, compute, algos, and data, how is China in comparison to the U.S. and what's happening over there? Yeah, so um, the, the U.S. put in, so roughly speaking, uh, the U.S. is ahead on compute for now. Uh, uh, China's ahead on data. And then, um, and then we're, we're probably the slight edge on algorithms, although that also won't last very long. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing here is that the, the White House put in place, or the White House and the Department of Commerce put in place very restrictive export controls. So a lot of the NVIDIA chips are very hard for Chinese companies or the Chinese government to get access to. Um, and that's been, uh, that I think is, you know, we'll see exactly what the long-term effects are, but the short-term effects is like preventing them from building large clusters of GPUs and really being competitive. Um, you know, the thing that I always worry about is like I kind of like run through the scenario in my head um, uh, over and over, which is if you had, uh, you know, these sort of uh, authoritarian um, state actors 
if they had access to, you know, for example, if Putin had access to very powerful AI systems today, what would he do with it? Not good things. It's like very clear, he's in an active war, he would do very bad things if he had access to powerful AI technology. And so um, I think the, the like threat surface area is very real of, you know, what's gonna happen if you have, um, you know, uh, state actors who are, you know, somewhat totalitarian and, and have sort of these like very, uh, very aggressive, you know, expansion plans, country expansion plans, like what's going to happen um, if they get access to such a powerful technology. And so, um, you know, the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, like hopefully that's not their intention with this technology, uh, but it's something that I'm concerned about for sure. I wish we had more time. I'm going to ask you two or, three, two or three quick questions. So one of them is AI regulation, AI policy, as well as AI safety. Uh, your thoughts on that? Um, Do you think that we should be more regulated, less regulated? How, or what role should government play? Uh, I think hugely important. I think government needs to play an incredibly big role. Um, this is, you know, we are creating an extremely powerful technology. And I think... Um, it is the role of governments to govern. I think that like, you know, the free market is obviously incredible and the reason we have all these innovations is because of the free market and I wouldn't kill the innovation element, but the potential consequences of this technology are staggering and we have to be very thoughtful about that. And AI safety? Yeah, I think that, you know, AI safety now, it's like, it's, it's almost like, a, it almost doesn't mean anything because there's just like, it's been such a, um, buzzword over the past year. And there's so many arguments, some of which are like crazy and don't make any sense, but some of which are very real and plausible, which, which fit under the umbrella of AI safety. What I would say is like this scenario that I talked about, Putin getting access to very powerful AI, I'm extremely worried about that. And if that's AI safety, like that's something we need to be worried about. So who you have over here and online is a lot of our customers that are using different technologies in the IT organizations. Uh, what advice would you have for them um, on how they should be thinking about AI and how they should be thinking about scale as they think about AI as well, if you want to put a plug in? Yeah, no, I think that the, the, the very big picture thing for every enterprise, every organization to be thinking about is, you know, um, uh, how are you going to harness your data to build something that's like, truly unique and build things that only you can build. Because I guarantee every enterprise is sitting on data that is, that is incredibly differentiated and incredibly um, unique and specialized and, and not something that, you know, uh, uh, that, that some startup is going to be able to replicate and, and generate or whatnot. So, so while all the, there's all this excitement around you know, uh, AI in the tech world, and obviously it's extremely exciting, but I think what's gonna be very, very um, exciting over the next, you know, let's call it decade, is seeing how all the existing businesses, organizations, enterprises really um, embrace their own data along with this new technology to build, you know, totally magical things. And so um, that's something that we're excited to work with folks on. Um, you know, we're obviously very excited to partner very closely with Cisco and yeah. building a lot of this up too for for all of Cisco's customers. And so um, we're we're uh, we're pumped. Hey, Alex, congratulations on building such a magical company in such a short period of time. Your, uh, your level of pulse on uh, the global economy, the markets, what's happening with AI is every single time I talk to you, I learn something new. It's a pleasure to have you over here. Hopefully, you'll come back again. And we're going to do a lot more together, so you're going to see a lot more of Alex and Cisco do a lot together. So thank you again. Thanks, G2. Thanks, buddy. Good job. <laughs>